Next, I'll talk about the genetic code. I won't spend much time on it since you probably already learned a lot about it in high school, but I'll cover some key points that you might see in your exam. The genetic code is used to translate RNA into protein. This is a codon table, and it shows that each amino acid is encoded by a set of three nucleotides, which is called a codon. Most amino acids are encoded by multiple codons. For example, phenylalanine is encoded by UUU and UUC. This means that the code is degenerate or redundant, since multiple codons code for the same amino acid. You might notice that of the amino acids that have multiple codons, the codons only vary by the nucleotide in the third position, which is why this is called the wobble base. Mutations in these third nucleotides will often not affect the amino acid sequence of the protein, and therefore these are silent mutations. Another feature is that the code is unambiguous, which means that each codon only codes for one amino acid. Our third feature is that it is commonless or non-overlapping. I'll explain this with an example. Let's say this is part of an RNA sequence is being read by a ribosome. After each codon is read, the RNA is moved over by three spaces, so it reads this codon, then this one, and then this one. No overlapping parts of codons will be read, such as this. Also, no nucleotides will be skipped. The only exception here is that some viruses can read RNA as overlapping codons. The last feature is that the code is universal. This means that in all species, this code is the same. If a codon codes for glutamine in one species, it'll also code for glutamine in all other species. There are a few different kinds of mutations that can occur in DNA. I've already talked about silent mutations, which are often caused by a change in the third or wobble base in a codon. This is the least problematic kind of mutation, since it doesn't really have an effect on the protein. A missense mutation also results from changing one nucleotide, but in this case, it'll also change the amino acid that the codon codes for. This can be relatively harmless, or extremely harmful, depending on a few things. First of all, if the mutation is in an important part of the protein, such as its active site, even a single amino acid change can prevent some enzymes from functioning. Second, changing from one amino acid to a similar one, such as from one medium-sized nonpolar amino acid to another medium-sized nonpolar amino acid, will usually have a smaller effect than changing from a positively charged to a negatively charged amino acid, or vice versa. Of course, in all these cases, the severity of the damage depends on the importance of the protein, since some proteins have more vital functions than others. Generally speaking, though, missense mutations are usually not that big of a deal. Next is nonsense mutations, which is when the nucleotide change converts a codon that codes for an amino acid to one that codes for a stop codon. If we take another look at our codon table, you can see that UUA normally codes for leucine, but if that middle nucleotide becomes an A, then we have UAA, which is a stop codon. Nonsense mutations have a much stronger effect on protein function, since you lose everything downstream of where the mutation occurred, which often has the same effect as deleting the protein entirely. A frame shift mutation is unique among all the ones listed here because it's the only one in which nucleotides are added or removed instead of just being changed. Since this throws off the commonless non-overlapping code that I mentioned a minute ago, everything downstream from the mutation will code for the wrong amino acids. For example, if we had this sequence broken into these codons, it makes sense because all the codons are correct. However, if this nucleotide is added, all the codons are shifted over and they all code for the wrong thing now. This usually causes a similar amount of damage as nonsense mutations. Now that we've talked about what DNA is made out of, which are nucleotides and codons, let's go over how it replicates itself when cells divide. DNA replication starts in an area called the origin of replication. There's only one of these in prokaryotic chromosomes, but eukaryotes have a bunch of them since they have a lot more DNA and it would take forever with only one. At this origin of replication, the two strands of DNA separate and form what looks like a bubble. Each end of this bubble is a replication fork, which you can see a more zoomed in and detailed version of here. As replication progresses, this will expand outward as the new strands of DNA are formed. This expansion depends on the enzyme helicase, which unzips the DNA and allows the bubble to expand. Helicase is the most fun of all the enzymes, since it spends all day unzipping genes. Sorry, bad joke. Anyway, helicase does this just by disrupting hydrogen bonds between the two strands. It doesn't need to make or break any covalent bonds. Since helicase is moving along the replication fork, something is needed to prevent the strands from reannealing to one another. This is where a protein called single-stranded binding proteins come into play, which is just that, a protein that recognizes and binds to single-stranded DNA to prevent it from binding to its complementary strand. The last proteins I'll mention on the subject of opening up DNA are the topoisomerases. These are proteins that regulate supercoiling of DNA. An analogy that you can use to think about supercoiling of DNA is to think about two strings that are anchored at one end and are then wound around one another. If you then pull the two ends apart from one another, the coils would become bunched up into a shorter length until you can't really pull them apart anymore. That's why you need topoisomerases.
Tope isomerase type 1 is used to reduce supercoiling, and it does this by cutting one strand, which allows the other one to pass through the hole, and then it reanneals the cut strand. This process does not require ATP, and this uncoiling of DNA is necessary in order to replicate it. Type 2 topo isomerases do require ATP, and they cut both strands of double-stranded DNA and then pass another double-stranded region through the hole before reannealing it. This can also be used to add coils to the DNA for the purpose of storing it in chromatin. Since regulating supercoils is such an important process in cells, if you inhibit them in bacteria by using fluoroquinolones, the bacteria are unable to divide. Okay, so now there's one more thing that needs to be done before we can start making more DNA, and that's adding RNA primers. There are no DNA polymerases that can initiate DNA synthesis from scratch. They have to build off of existing DNA or RNA. Primase, however, can synthesize RNA from scratch, by which I mean it can add ribonucleotides to their complementary DNA bases and connect them together. Once a primer has been laid down, DNA polymerase 3 can jump in and start adding deoxyribonucleotides to it. In other words, copying the existing DNA template strands to make complementary strands, and thereby replicating DNA. The term used for this is semi-conservative replication, which means that each new piece of double-stranded DNA will contain one of the original strands and one new one. DNA can only be synthesized in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, so DNA polymerase will start from an RNA primer and build towards a 3' prime end of the new strand. As it's doing this, it proofreads its work, and if it realizes it made a mistake by adding the wrong nucleotide, it can remove it by using its 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease. This is, of course, the opposite direction as DNA synthesis, since it's going backward to remove mistakes. Now the caveat here is that only one strand of each replication fork allows continuous synthesis in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. In this image, it's the top strand, which you can see started at the 5' prime end and is building towards the 3' prime end. Since the other strand, shown on the bottom, has to be synthesized from the replication fork towards the origin of replication, many RNA primers have to be laid down to allow DNA synthesis from each one. This is slower than the other strand so it's called the lagging strand, whereas the one in which replication can occur continuously and quickly is called the leading strand. Each piece of DNA in the lagging strand is called the Nokazaki fragment. After the lagging strand has become a continuous stretch of alternating RNA primers and Nokazaki fragments, the only thing left is for a different polymerase, which is DNA polymerase type 1, to remove the RNA primers using its 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease activity and fill in the gap with DNA as it goes. Lastly, DNA ligase will seal the holes between the DNA fragments. The last problem we have is what to do about the ends of the chromosomes. The leading strand has no problem, since it can just synthesize DNA all the way to the end. But the lagging strand is dependent on RNA primers, and the last RNA primer can't be filled in with DNA once it's removed, since DNA synthesis would require another primer to build off of. Therefore, a few hundred nucleotides are lost every time the cell divides. The solution is to use telomerase, which is a ribonucleotide protein that repetitively adds a six-nucleotide sequence, TTAGGG, to the end of the lagging strand creating non-coding junk DNA that can be lost without harming the function of the cell. In adults, telomerase is only expressed in cells that need to divide a lot, such as stem cells and some cells in the immune system, although mutations that cause telomerase to be expressed in other cell types are one of the things that are necessary for a neoplastic transformation, since without telomerase, even cancer cells will lose the ability to divide after a while. DNA replication is extremely accurate and only rarely results in mutations. Environmental factors, such as sunlight, radiation, carcinogenic chemicals, and even the oxidative stress that results from normal metabolism, can cause mutations much more commonly. So how are these mutations fixed? Well, it depends on the type of mutation. Ultraviolet light, which is the part of sunlight that gives you a sunburn, causes adjacent thymidine bases in DNA to covalently attach to one another, forming a thymidine dimer. This can cause mutations in the next round of DNA replication. This is the most important kind of mutation that's resolved by a first repair mechanism called nucleotide excision repair. Basically, the enzymes involved in this repair pathway will cut the damaged strand upstream and downstream from the site of damage and remove the oligonucleotide, and then DNA polymerase can come fill in the gap and ligase seals the holes. If the enzymes involved in this repair pathway are mutant or deficient, this causes a disease called xeroderma pigmentosum. Cells in these patients can't repair thymidine dimers, so they're particularly sensitive to sunlight and have dry skin and a high prevalence of melanoma and other cancers. This picture shows a squamous cell carcinoma in one such patient. Base excision repair is another repair mechanism which fixes bases that have been covalently modified, and it starts just the way it sounds. The damaged base is excised after being recognized by glycosylases. This results in an AP site, where AP stands for apyrimidinic or apyrimidinic, which means the purine or the pyrimidine base has been removed. Next, an AP endonuclease cuts the DNA next to the AP site, and either just that single nucleotide is removed, or a string of up to 10 nucleotides is removed. Once again, DNA polymerase fills in the gap and ligase seals it shut.
The last type of single-strand repair pathway is mismatch repair, and this fixes mutations that have resulted in DNA mismatch, which is when bases that are lined up in a complementary sequence don't match. For example, in this case, T and G don't match. This can happen during DNA replication, since the DNA polymerase proofreading is good but not perfect. Now this is a little more complicated than the two pathways I talked about before, because in both of those it was easy to tell where the damage was. Thymidine dimers and covalently modified bases are obviously the problem. In this case, however, it's not immediately clear which strand is normal and which one is mutant. Should this be a C bound to a G or an A bound to a T? To handle this issue, cells can look at methylation. Some cytosines are methylated for a few reasons, including regulation of gene expression, and the strand that is not methylated must be the new strand, since it hasn't been methylated yet. This is probably the one with the error, and needs to be corrected to match the parent strand. From this point, it becomes similar to what we've already discussed. Endonucleases will nick the mutated strand a few bases upstream and downstream from the mutation, and then exonucleases remove that piece of DNA, and DNA polymerase and ligase will add the nucleotides back in and seal it shut. If enzymes involved in mismatch repair are mutated or deficient, patients have a high prevalence of hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. The last repair pathway I'll go over fixes double-stranded breaks. It's called non-homologous end joining because it joins together two ends of double-stranded DNA because it joins together two strands of double-stranded DNA which are not homologous since they are clean breaks with no single-stranded overhang. The mechanism here is low yield for your exam, so I won't go through it, but the clinical consequences might be relevant. First of all, these kinds of double-stranded breaks are often caused by X-ray radiation, so these patients would be particularly sensitive to X-rays and CT scans, and you should avoid these if possible. Also, the VDJ recombination pathway used by lymphocytes to make antibodies and T-cell receptors utilize non-homologous end joining, so patients who are deficient in this pathway can have severe combined immunodeficiency. DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis direction is not particularly high yield, but I'll go through the important parts. You should definitely know that both DNA and RNA synthesis proceed in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and that protein synthesis goes from N to C. It helps me to remember that 5 to 3 rhymes with N to C. Aside from that, you should know that nucleotides are added to a growing strand by having the 3' prime hydroxyl from the last nucleotide bind to the first phosphate from a nucleotide triphosphate, which leaves you with one phosphate connecting each pair of nucleotides. This is important because some drugs that block DNA replication are basically just nucleotides that have a modification to this 3' hydroxyl, so they'll still be added to the strand, but then don't allow it to grow further. For example, the thymidine analog zidovudine, also known as AZT, is used to treat HIV because the viral transcriptase will add it to the growing strand, but then can't build off of it any further since it's missing the 3' hydroxyl group. The azido group, shown here, helps across the lipid bilayer to get into cells. Staphidine is also used to treat HIV using the same mechanism, only instead of replacing the hydroxyl group with an acido group, it's just been removed.